Dear participants, we'll start within two minutes. So, Jansi. Uh, yes, sir. So, what's the profile of the uh, participants? So, 60, pa 60 participants are there, sir. No, I'm sir. They are all research scholars and uh, assistant professor of various institutions, sir. And all are computer science? No, sir. Management. Business okay. All are business administration only. Yeah. Oh, that's very nice. It's from commerce also, sir. Oh, that's very nice. That's very nice. So this is a uh, MBA campus, is it? Yes, campus. Yes, sir. And you do research as well. The School of Management campus, Alaiyappa University. Yeah. Uh, do you res do research? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You do research in management or? Research in management, sir. And doctoral studies and kind of? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. So we are offering MBA degree as well as PhD. Oh, okay. In our department, sir, we conduct uh, research on international business areas specifically sir international finance international economics and international trade oh okay good to know good to know yes. shall we start sir yep let's start Okay. To kickstart the proceedings of this technical section 8 formally, I now request Dr. S. Gopal Swami sir, Assistant Professor and the Organizing Secretary of this FDP to welcome and introduce Mr. Praveen sir to all of us. Thank you, Jansi, and good afternoon to all the participants. Welcome to the third day of the AACT sponsored Atal Strategy Development Program on Blockchain in FinTech. This program has been successfully for the past two days. In continuation of this program, today's topic is really interesting and special. The resource person is also special. And I'm very happy to introduce our today's guest speaker, Mr. P.S. Praveen. Mr. Praveen is basically a mechanical, mechanical engineer, and he pursued his master in business administration in Anna University with a specialization in marketing and systems. And he is currently working as a country manager, blockchain monk, fintech solution, Chennai Tamil Nadu. He has more than 20 years of experience in the technology field. 
He has worked in many companies such as Escort Construction Equipment Limited, wherein he worked as a manager for eight years, and then he worked as a group manager in Ushakam for around four years. Then he became CEO of Extreme Technologies, wherein he continued for four years and finally landed in the current position as a country manager. His responsibility includes lot accounting management, operation management, development of uh, strategic plan for setting up startups and new strategic uh, business units, effective resource utilization and administration, obtaining technology certifications, negotiating strategic alliance and partnership with organizations and institutions. Till date, he has trained more than 5,000 people on black, uh, blockchain technologies and he is an uh, enterprise blockchain service specialist and he has launched various conferences in India related to black, blockchain technology opportunities and challenges. He is an active member of Blockchain Industry Group USA and Blockchain Consortium Mumbai. So without wasting much of his time, now I am hand over, I mean, handing over the session to Mr. Praveen. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Gopal Sami. Uh, it's a nice Sunday, and uh, it's very impressive that you guys are uh, spending your time for knowing something on a Sunday. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, uh, my topic for the day is what is fintech history and uh, history of the fintech evolution and the fintech landscape. So, if you see. Uh, uh, the agenda for the day, uh, uh, we will talk about what is fintech and then history of fintech and uh, there are different types of uh, spaces like cards, ATM, uh, stock markets, banking where we talk fintech frequently and then uh, we'll break for uh, 30 minutes, uh, after 30 minutes we'll break for about a few minutes for Q&A and then we'll take on the fintech landscape and then uh, that will go on for another 30 minutes and then uh, we'll at about 12 45 we'll have uh, a small uh, break and then uh, i will open up with uh, uh, with an, an opportunity in fintech because what's the point learning fintech without knowing what's the opportunity at this moment for us uh, as management uh, people or the management professors who teach fintech and uh, other uh, things so the history of the fintech evolution is uh, what is very very important to understand how it started and what was fintech first so let's understand how it uh, evolved so let's get started so we are witnessing a creative destruction of financial services arranging uh, rearranging itself around consumer who does this in the most relevant exciting way using data and digital wins so arvind shankaran is a ex infosys ex mckinsey and now he's a venture capitalist and he's based out of uh, singapore i thought it's a very good quote to understand today at as, a, as a big context of fintech uh, services so what is fintech so fintech uh, describes an inter intersection between software and technology to deliver financial services many refer to technical innovation applied in traditional financial services context to innovative financial services offering which we'll see at the middle of the this program that disrupt the existing financial market so innovation is the key hub of this entire thing so the fintech if you if you want to understand what is fintech it is payments when you say payments it's credit cards it's um, debit cards then you can uh, talk about international payments then you can talk about uh, uh, trade finance and kind of payments and uh, then financing is a, a lending thing then investments, then investments is what you put money for future uh, returns and then big data, uh, which we'll talk about it, then insurance and advisory. Uh, so you will always find there is a commonality, one or two items, all the three items, all the six items kind of things happens in FinTech. Uh, 
is not a vertical pillar kind of structure which we used to have uh, in the 90s. Now it is all hybrid structures you will see. Uh, you may have big data and financing in some place. You may have insurance and big data somewhere. And uh, insurance and big data for risk management, advisory and uh, uh, big data for something. So big data will play a common role in most of it. We'll talk about it in the next few slides. So when you see the fintech, it's very important to understand how the fintech is figured out. I don't know whether you can see the slide. Uh, the fintech is 19, 1886 to 1887 can be called as fintech 1.0. 1967 to 2008 can be called 2000, uh, fintech 2.0. And uh, 2008 till current, that is 2020, you can talk about 3.0 and there can be a 3.5 as well. Uh, <coughs> always uh, 3 comes from 2 and 2 comes from 1, but then Without one, two could have not happened, and without two, three could have happened, could not happen, and then that's the correlation it has. So if you see uh, geography, the global and the key elements of fintech zero is the infrastructure or computerization is uh, what uh, the fintech 1.0 is talking about. But then when you uh, move to fintech 2.0, the infrastructure plus internet gets added up. So this is where is FinTech 2.0, uh, where internet uh, joined and then there's a something called digitization started as early as 1960s. And it took almost like 35 years to come to uh, some place in digitization. And then when you see FinTech 3.0, then the mobile comes in and then the infrastructure, which is the PC or laptop, now replaced by mobiles. This is a very remarkable change of the form factor uh, because the PC used to make you uh, fix it to a particular location or an office or a laptop would at most can move you a little, but then the mobile now moves everywhere. It goes into the toilet, it can go to anywhere where the laptops and uh, other devices could not go. And then in between you have tabs as well. So the 3.0 is like powered by the mobile revolution. And then uh, you have the smartphone coming up at the same time, the financial crisis happening in 2008. But that's where uh, the Bitcoin was born. And then 3.5 was born and the emerging and developing technologies, again, using platforms like mobile tab, uh, PCs and desktops are continuing. So these are the one, two, three, 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 three point five of uh, fintech uh, revolution. So the first thing, which is uh, beginning of fintech, that is, if you are to talk about something called uh, the diner card, and uh, Mr. McNamara and his uh, friend Ralph Snyder, both from different industries, uh, they launched a diner card, which is like for a person. Even now, we go go to eat out, we go and spend money there. So predominantly, in, in, in order to move the cash into a card form, uh, they built this diner card as a, a revolutionary concept in 1950. And uh, that's where it started. And then Bank of America uh, licensed the credit card technology to various banks. And it took next 20 years, uh, you know, uh, to go this into initially it was a card uh, cardboard actually and uh, that's why it's called card but then uh, it went plastic uh, for reliability and users uh, of various places and uh, i don't know whether you guys have seen the earlier edcs electronic data uh, uh, computers edc used to be very big it's almost like today's tab size and as thick as a laptop and uh, people used to swipe cards on that uh, using a paper and uh, trace your card on the paper it's a carbon copy and it is and then enter manually the uh, what you call your expense into it and uh, they used to give you one slip and uh, the charge slip used to go back to the bank and the bank used to send a summary of your statement i think it is way back in 1990s this used to continue in india but then uh, soon in 2000 to 2010, 
uh, it became uh, paperless and it became the current point of sale terminals we'll talk about it also in the in the middle of the session then again uh, 1960 10 years later this card machines were uh, card uh, pushed an idea why not have a automatic teller machine uh, so automatic teller machines were uh, started in 1960s and Barclays Bank rolled out the first uh, thing and it took almost like seven years and uh, the company which I worked for uh, they also installed a lot of uh, ATMs uh, in the Royal Bank of Scotland and uh, there they installed a lot of uh, uh, ATMs and uh, ATM became a cash uh, machine without going to the bank. So this is again another convenience and it is uh, almost like uh, 40 plus 20, 60 year old and this uh, technology is still serving us and uh, many of us will pray the ATM uh, if you have gone through the tormenting times of uh, demonetization and uh, demonetization created such an importance for this device. The banks were closed, everything was closed, it was not invented for such a situation but then uh, the ATM helped us. Uh, during the demonetization period and uh, everybody used to run one ATM to another but then ATM was the only infrastructure which supported us during the demonetization. Uh, so again another uh, beauty of this robust technology called ATM. Uh, so 1960 uh, uh, is the beginning of uh, automatic telling machines. And then 1970, the stock markets, like, uh, you know, people thought that, you know, what's the point sitting in a big hall and shouting the stock trades and all that. NASDAQ, that is National Association of Security Dealers and Automation Automated Courts, made a trading electronic, which is uh, reduced the spread. Meaning, uh, spread means the margins, like manually, you know, uh, I don't know, you guys have traded uh, paper thing, I did that. So when I buy a stock, then uh, what I do is I go to the broker, the broker will uh, take my signature and then send it to the stock market and then the stock market will, uh, the, uh, the BSC at that time would stamp and then return back the stock to the broker and the broker will give me that and I will hold a hard copy of my stock holding. So uh, that is a very, uh, what you call tedious and cumbersome thing. Uh, where the things were lost due to rain, destruction or loss, somebody stealing your stocks and all that. So this electronic form was introduced in 1970 by NASDAQ. Uh, so you might be thinking why am I talking everything US and kind of things. But then the next few slides you'll find how you will be surprised to find that Indians were not behind this kind of fintech technology. So the Bombay Stock Exchange and uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange was established in 1875. Just imagine. And uh, in 1875, they were called the Native Share and Stock Brokers Association. And they used to uh, trade the most expensive part at that time, cotton. And uh, they used to do cotton trading because uh, India was full of spinning mills and cotton was very important. And uh, people used to uh, go and trade uh, manually, uh, like uh, today's all mandis, like all the cooperative uh, mandis which are there in each uh, uh, district headquarters. This was also one of them where people used to go there. And uh, the Dhirubhai Ambani story will show you one of this kind of uh, uh, what you call uh, manual uh, ordering of stocks and trades and trading transactions in a particular place. But then 31st August 1957 became the first uh, Indian stock exchange and 1995 it automated uh, uh, a bolt that is BSC online trading uh, uh, capacity of 8 million orders per day. And this was nothing ordinary and uh, it was developed by a IT company called CMC Limited. This is again a very landmark thing that uh, India did not uh, uh, was not behind the international players and we also uh, caught up with um, <coughs> with the brand called Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, then comes the National Stock Exchange which is the NSE. It was incorporated in 1992 
but then bombay stock exchange did not go digital but the national stock exchange like nasdaq it went digital and it went uh, it started equities in 1994 and it uh, gave derivatives that is the options and uh, uh, what you call uh, options and uh, 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 the derivative segment was added okay uh, options and futures uh, the first exchange in india to introduce electronic trading uh connecting the entire base of thing under the market capitalization at this moment is about 2.27 trillion this is slightly dated information it may be about uh, 5 trillion dollars today so again uh, another situation is that in uh, uh, india also was uh, bracing uh, technology every 10 years uh, behind the uh, american markets 10 years about so the core banking uh, the banks used to do physical uh, what you call uh, uh, documentation checks used to be deposited everybody has to go to the teller to make the dd everybody had to go but then rangarajan committee report in 1981 uh, they uh, that triggered something called banking automation and then some total of information technology components that enable bank to manage core business activities in a centralized model uh, but then the previous speaker uh, in this uh, particular thing he must have talked about decentralized uh, which i will be talking to you tomorrow and uh, centralized model though it was uh, at that time an advanced technology and the round the clock processing of uh, products and services also was made 24 by 7 by 365 days was in what is it was a goal but then uh even today 24 bar 7 uh, 365 is not all services they don't give dds 24 bar 7 uh but then they still have a long way to go uh but then they have moved progressively from 1981 from core banking applications which came became manual to uh you know um, a single uh, ledger entries uh and they made lot of uh, uh bank unions had lot of trouble with them for next 20 years up to 2000 itself they were talking about fighting against this automation because it reduced the uh, number of manpower and uh, number of manpower reduction means like uh, uh there were uh, some funny jobs like uh in an office there was a guy who is to only pick the big big ledgers and move here and there and uh, there used to be uh people running between banks to move documentation and all these jobs went off because uh, the the information technology was shared on networks in those periods it was a leased line networks and secure networks we sats and satellites at that time when it started uh, so all these jobs did, did definitely go but then they were very very low end uh, what you call uh, what you call manual jobs which anyway had to go and also around this time uh, the fax machine also was uh, going out of uh, what you call uh, uh, i think till 1990s also i saw the fax machines and then about 2000 uh, the fax machine also went out of uh, thing because email replaced the fax machine the disruption uh, in it uh, came up there again the components of core banking uh, i just wanted to highlight it's a banking application which is a software then the hardware components like pc servers hard disk storage and all that and the network infrastructure which connected it and then the centralized data processing capabilities like oracle and you had a range of databases now everything has come down uh, to become oracle because oracle merged with all those uh, companies like people soft and other uh database companies uh, we just have oracle and a couple of other small database companies uh so centralized data processing happened as a uh, what do you call instead of uh, sending uh, what do you call uh, physical reports to every branch and branch to region region to the center uh, it was uh, electronically done uh i am stopping now for uh, q and a any questions
Hello. So uh, this is all history. So definitely, um, uh, it would be slightly uh, drag. But then uh, from the next session, I think you will have very interesting, uh, uh, important uh, things happening. So the financial inclusion is a core uh, part of uh, fintech. Okay, uh, financial inclusion is that unbanked population has to be banked. That's very important. Even today, people talk about unbanking. Uh, unbanked population to be banked and usage of banking services to the remote villages, rise of connected populace, that is how a villager can get uh, connected to the mainstream and uh, digital transactions are paving way to do a lot of uh, transactions and uh, access to credit, that is loan, uh, is a major stumbling back. Like, uh, for example, how can a uh, 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 how can a person in a village uh, get a loan of 2000 rupees? That's very difficult to answer. It's very difficult to answer and nobody is there in that space. Anybody who wants 10,000 rupees, no. They have to go to all these uh, pawn brokers and high interest rate people. Uh, but then now FinTech has made it possible. Uh, I'll talk about that opportunity in the last session. Uh, that's where a fintech company itself becomes a, a bank kind of company. So the fintech in industry structure is uh, like we touched upon a few, but then we'll do it in all. Okay. Now it has uh, capital markets, mobile wallets, payment gateways, online lending, card acceptance, and car credit rating. Uh, bills, recharges, this is a utility bill services, insurance. So these all make up the fintech segmentation in India and they can be based out of a cloud service and they may have big data services, definitely, and advanced security solutions. And trends are about by estimated 48 to 60 billion dollars by 2020 this year uh, is what the projection. So very important to understand is fintech is a very, very high growth segment. Uh, everybody of us to uh, focus on. So in a fintech segment, what kind of segmentation? It's a new type of banking, digital lending, wealth tech, insurance tech, digital payments, reg tech. Now reg tech is reg regulation tech technology. And this is the beautiful example where GST has implemented a, uh, online services of regulation technology, uh, tax payments. Also, the regulation technology of income tax payments have also been done. Uh, so, RegTech is another very, very different segment. Uh, it is not in any, uh, it's not a part of bank. It is not digital lending. RegTech is compliance to regulations uh, is that. And then uh, if you see the growth of number of point of sale terminals in India, uh, pre-demonetization is 1.5 million, October 2016. And post-demonetization, April 2020, that is, almost like it has gone five times, uh, 3.4x. And digital payments breakdown uh, is like uh, $2 billion about. And uh, you will find that during this time, uh, unicorns were developed. And uh, a unicorn, which is a, a billion dollar company, and Paytm became a unicorn within a year. Uh, you know very well Paytm. Uh, seized that opportunity, it had the platform ready exactly during the time of your uh, demonetization and it uh, really picked it up. And uh, Paytm is one big unicorn which made billion dollars in a year. Uh, so that's a beauty uh, of a unicorn. Uh, unicorns are being made and there's an opportunity of a unicorn which I will share it with you at the end of this uh, presentation. So what are the pillars of fintech? Uh, pillars of fintech, you should have investors, definitely. Then you should have uh, government regulation. Then you should have universities and research institutions like you. And then we have financial institutions like banks. Then you should have uh, uh, what you call accelerators or innovation labs. And uh, then you should have, sorry, uh, you should have users. And then you have tech vendors. 
and then you have startups these are all the ecosystem of a fintech and then once these are uh, matured which is now uh, uh, 10 years back if you see uh, there were not much of startups and uh, there were not many users and then there were not many accelerator programs and uh, universities also used to be number of universities about 15 years ago number of universities less the research also were less the incubation also was not done so these all have come together and uh, the fintech uh, bubble is uh, now becoming a big big game to play so if you see another view is that uh, who are these players so the who are these players the reserve bank of india is uh, one and then you have banks traditional finance companies hdfc icici union bank government banks and state bank and then you have tech companies wipro lnt infosys and this one and then you have companies that provide technology financial transactions uh, teminos is a, a core banking software company fi serve is also an, a network company my company the company which i work uh, transaction network services provide networks for all these banks to communicate amongst each other between the customer point of sale terminals we'll talk about it in the next section and then you have the new disruptive technologies like airtel payments bank paytm and kind of things so these are all the ambience where you know if somebody sleeps like this bank slept paytm comes up and if this uh, tech companies does not do anything then these uh, companies providing technology will add a portion of this tech companies as a production environment and hand it over to the banks so uh, there's a range of uh, what you call uh, competition amongst these elements also so another emerging intersection of fintech you have agri tech health tech and property uh, property tech you know property is again a very big uh, game to play worldwide property is a disputed situation and blockchain plays a big role and uh, blockchain makes property uh, records uh, very transparent and uh, very uh, distributed nature uh, so again this is again a intersection of finance and uh, things we can do a lot of uh, advancements in uh, agriculture now we are talking about the new agricultural law where the the farmer gets the best price he wants otherwise he has to sell it in the same village unbelievable isn't it uh, he is like a slave he has to work hard 24 hours day and then when he makes a produce the village panchayat or the gunda there or the politician there will simply collect his produce give him whatever he thinks and that's what is the msp if you see the msp they just want to fix the msp in such a way that they'll throw this money on their face exactly uh, the msp will be given to the farmer and this big uh, rowdies and the traders who are sitting there they'll simply take the produce and go away so agri tech again online technology where uh, people are able to get uh, uh, the best price for their produce again health tech uh, you can put your uh, data on uh, online you can share it with across the world uh, doctors get consultancy and so on and so forth this is again a health tech uh, scenario where financial transactions happen again you know i want to talk to you about uh, big data uh, situation the big data is what you know at one point of time uh, it was 800000 petabytes in 2009 and now it is 35 zeta bytes in 2020 so data has increased by 44x and uh, this data is a great uh, thing but then 80% plus is unstructured data and the unstructured data nature means it won't be in the same format you won't get all the data in the same format so you need to work with unstructured data and there is a lot of technologies which is around unstructured data analysis which is a part of uh, uh, machine learning uh, ai and big data analytics so what happens in big data analytics in banks is data is uh, created or collection of data is connected and stored they fetch the data they make a mod so uh, it's a typical standard process of data uh, or how the data is modeled and uh, for example 
classical examples in management schools is that uh, why to put uh, beer next to the uh, nappy pads of the baby uh, what do you call pads uh, because the young husband when he comes to the shop he wants to pick beer he does not want to uh, push the trolley till the beer section so people started such innovative uh, racks uh, technology uh, placement of products where uh, the products will sell a lot in the retail infrastructure so these are all the big data analytics which uh, arrive from such uh, behavioral uh, data which comes from the uh, different sources again uh, where does the data come from it come from google twitter uh, you know like google is unbelievably large data per day and 12 terabytes from twitter 25 terabytes and and then there are so many iot's also running uh, data structures so many of them 4.5 4.6 billion camera phones worldwide hundreds and millions of gps enabled devices 2 plus billion people on the web uh, end of 2011 but then you know unbelievable number of people would be like you know uh, i think uh, almost like double triple this uh, numbers this data this this data is slightly old uh, but then you will get so much of data but then what to do with this data that's the uh, charm you will get from big data analytics so again another thing is that during this rush of things like you have technology you have networks you have internet you have then you have disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence then you have quantum computing you have blockchain then you have api robotic process automation instant payments and then you have augmented reality prescriptive securities smart machines so on and so forth and they really have different levels of impact from low medium and high and transformational impacts on uh, technologies like api you know earlier the software companies used to never build an open API platforms and now they are building open API platforms to integrate anybody and everybody so that the multiplier effects of the technology will happen. So that's where it is and then artificial intelligence is another a tool with which you can make uh, informed decisions. Top trends uh, in uh, 2020, uh, so open banking, Already in the UK, uh, we are also not going to the bank, right? No one of us are going to bank, but we still have a bank branch and everything. But there, they have a bank, uh, what do you call, it's just an open bank, that's it. They don't have any service. They just have a website, which is a robust website, which provides all services. They may send you a checkbook and they may send you your credit card, debit cards to you, but otherwise it's just open banking. Then uh, you have a new trend on AI and machine learning. I spoke to you earlier on and personalized advice, uh, investment advice. I'll talk about it uh, later uh, in this presentation. Then you have lending and crowdfunding platforms. During the Bitcoin and blockchain uh, evolution, uh, lending platforms got disrupted and uh, crowdfunding got accelerated and uh, people could set up uh, websites which can attract crowdfunding worldwide and they raise millions of dollars bypassing the banks and uh, venture capitalists then you can have security and identity services then you have blockchain and you have payment technologies uh, these are the things which we will talk uh, in a short while so let me stop uh, for a while so that i can ask if anybody wants a questions Hello. Did I put everybody to sleep? You are audible, sir. I am audible, but then everybody is alive. Yes, sir. Any questions? Yes, sir. We are all alive. I know. I know. Any questions? Sir. I have a question uh, related to big data. Uh, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, numbers of uh, millions of data, terabytes of data is generated from the different devices and resources. 
so how we can manage how we can uh, drill down or we can retrieve the insight that will be hidden inside that data is there any technology or uh, uh, program through that we can do that yeah actually uh, yeah, i suggest i suggest to uh, yeah, misalo go mute uh so uh, see basically uh, big data is like too much of information and uh, and chaotic information it just comes in different forms and uh, things but what i would say to a question like this you should go through a program of big data and then followed by uh, machine learning uh, and then followed by ai then only you will be uh, able to handle and use data in a very uh, constructive way i have answered your question yes yes thank you so uh, see basically um, as managers as teachers in fact uh, as you know that's why i asked earlier on that are you doing research so your uh, this uh, alagappa university or the any one of you you are participating here your universities also can start uh, uh, impromptu or your own uh, things put the students on work and to analyze big data and produce uh, valuable uh, billable that is you can start producing uh, data uh, for various industries of your choice uh, because uh, uh big data is everywhere okay uh, you can do weather you can do business you can do uh, retail you can do telecom you can do anything using big data and you can derive uh, what you call very uh, valuable decisions based on the big data trends on a dynamic basis so you could uh, do it at a research level in your uh, uh, various uh, uh, universities and uh, basically because you have a very powerful resource under you as professors uh, the students which are there to do work but then they are not given work they are repeatedly doing the copy work of the photocopy shop they go and bring the photocopy print and then go away you should not do that you should a lot real time work of the current nature build your ipr for your university or your business school and uh, uh, put out uh uh reports uh then people will, industry will come rushing to you to buy that data that's very important so this is a very great opportunity i didn't want to talk about it but then this question uh, led to that any questions sir i have one question sir yes. raghu sir uh, related to this foreign exchange trading sir in world stock market yeah uh, what kind of otc platform they are using sir to buy and sell options or futures or whatever the means we are transacting uh, we are making transactions for this foreign exchange so in terms of foreign exchange trading there are some very standard platforms and uh, uh, also your uh, banks can uh, give you that fx platforms and uh, you can also subscribe to international platforms and uh, be careful uh, that don't uh, subscribe to uh, platforms which commit to you 100% daily basis return uh, so they are all cheating platforms so uh, do subscribe to pretty large uh, 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 platforms worldwide like city bank has a own platform then uh, you have bank of america as a big another platform so you can subscribe to those uh, sitting in india and in india everybody is allotted 250000 dollars to invest anywhere in the world so you can do trading you can buy houses you can do whatever you want so you can subscribe to that and uh, register to a bank and then uh, do it and a company like us transaction network services connects to fx liquidity worldwide and uh, we connect uh, banks like icici bank to international liquidity and uh, thomson reuters is one more uh, place where you can do trading and uh, mcx is another one nsc national stock exchange also you can do rupee dollar you can trade uh, rupee dollar rupee yen uh, 
uh, rupee uh, what they call if you want to do other currencies usd europe uh, eu uh, then usd pound sterling usd yen and then usd i think 80% of the traffic is around this uh, usd do, usd to pound usd to euro usd to yen uh, are the 80% traffic so you should look at these three pairs in terms of trading uh, fx any questions thank you so much sir so i will continue uh, something called point of sale terminals which you'll find on every uh, retail market jewelry shops or any uh, where you will go and swipe your card and uh, you will get an input and upon amount and you will generate a receipt this point of sale has matured it was so big uh, like a, almost like a laptop size now it has become very small and uh, even palm size things have come uh, which don't have printers so uh, these are very uh, interesting uh, devices which made uh, you know uh, credit card applications credit card liquidity uh, into the market point of sale is a very uh, remarkable device uh, which uh, tns as our company manages uh, worldwide uh, for banks so what happens is in a transaction uh, you and the box uh, you uh, you are at the uh, teller and then you the point of sale device are these types and there are many more types now and then it communicates to a gateway which is managed by uh, what tns and then we connect to their servers so it connected to primary secondary and uh, disaster recovery sites and then uh, these transactions go to the server and the server says you have money and immediately the transaction receipt comes back so that's what is about 5 to 6 seconds uh, point of sale terminals work that way same way the atm works the atm goes through the telephone network and then connects to the atm and the bank to the host and the host to the bank and atm transactions happen and uh, it's also about 5 to 6 seconds but then it delays because they want to put ads on your screen <laughs> that's a great trick actually they'll suddenly put an ad or suddenly push some uh, loan or suddenly push some things on so that delays because of the bank which provides uh, what you call some pictures here and there so it has little more advanced uh, nature because uh, the point of sale terminal does not have any screen in this case you have a very small screen which we can uh, monetize by giving uh, services so if you see the payment revenues which is atm and pause and all it is gone very very high 2010 it was 805 billion dollars now it is uh, 2.4 trillion dollars uh, the payment transactions revenues but then actually 953 uh, uh billion dollars will be the revenues uh, that's a very beautiful uh, area the, the, the revenues to the, the the money which is paid to the service providers uh, so this is the money which goes through them but then they get about 30 39% of the uh, cut for the doing this technology so again uh, you will see that the growth of payment revenues is outpaced the gdp so if you see the payments to the nominal gdp uh, it's almost like one is to one now uh, so uh, that's another uh, beauty it was earlier the gdp was uh, higher than the payments uh, volume but now it's almost like one is to one uh, in 2019 so i stop here uh, the payments any questions on payments so people have started using point of sale terminals to give loans also okay and they have used point of sale terminals also to uh, collect micro payments also uh, they go to the villages with this machine and then collect money and give the receipt right away so they use that also so different uses of payment point of sale terminals are there and it has gone beyond its uh, ways of design it is doing lot of innovative work uh, in the payments technology so now you see a robotic hand and a human being and there's lot of money here and uh, this is what is a uh, beauty uh, this uh, is a, a, a thing called investment and uh, it's a robo advisor that means now you don't need anybody to do uh, uh, sit with you for one hour to understand what is your investment what is your risk what is the thing and what is the age nothing 
everything is done automatically online you log into a site it simply profiles your risk your name address your annual salary your monthly disposable income everything is entered there your goals are entered there and then the goals once they entered then immediately the output comes your emi per month is so much that's all which i did it in 2004 uh i had to sit with one person uh, for about 4 hours to enter uh, some 20 pages form in this case it's not required it just finishes off in about uh, uh, 45 minutes max uh, if you do a thing and the robo advisors are like very famous these days and uh, you may be thinking that these are uh, not in india yes they are in india and there are a lot of companies which are doing this and uh, there are no uh, wealth managers there are no fellow who is coming and meeting you it will be automated the your document will be made ready then it will be sent to pdf and then you will sign it off and then you will finish and you will start investing so i am having one robot uh, robotic advisory and i am investing every month uh, a sum of amount and it goes to my investments and it balances my investment it does everything so this is where the automation increases the volume of customers and uh, the increase in uh, the customer uh, this one so the robo advisory is 24 bar 7 low cost uh, otherwise iams used to be recruited for this business because that is a very critical subject uh, people used to the low cost transparency user experience and uh, you know targeting small investors i'll share with you this uh, presentation and uh, you can uh, uh, use this link to find out robo advisory in india i'll stop here and in terms of technology i just completed and uh, any questions or i'll finish the enabling uh, environment okay and uh, very important is that fintech is not by its own it needs an enabling environment it needs phones it needs internet it needs users okay and india is uh, 2020 is uh, number 2 in the world actually uh, top number 2 in the world <laughs> top number 2 in mobiles and top in number 2 in the world in uh, users and uh, smartphone users are number 2 in the world so uh, this is a great slide which everybody should see because this part uh, smartphone users is a great opportunity and this 520 million people are your market and that's the beauty and 650 million users on internet is also another market and uh, 1200 million uh, uh, 1.2 billion people uh, using mobile phones also is a market so this is a very interesting understanding how digitalized uh, users are in india another enabler is wireless subscription if you see the wireless subscription uh, in uh, 2007 it was only 165 million now it is crossed 1.14 billion and internet subscriber it is 22.86 and 2020 it is 7, 718 million subscribers so that's the beauty and these are the enablers of fintech and uh, if you see in the wireless thing the wireline has become 1.75 and 98% is wireless i just imagine uh, india would have not imagined that uh, landline services will go almost like such a small way and uh, i'm also surprised 42 but then very soon rural will catch up so this again a beauty is the enabling infrastructure while uh, things are coming up again the growth of gadgets you have smartphones tablets laptops and desktops you'll find from 2005 to 2013 which is i'm just showing a trend now but then uh, it has grown exponentially but then if you see the smartphone uh, that's the one which went very 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 high uh, it has exponentially grown and this is the market you should look at uh, for fintech services again another scene where you will see uh, uh, that china uh, is uh, 69% fintech uh, thing and india is 52% fintech it's already number 2 in the world in fintech adoption rates and uh, across 20 markets we are much better than singapore we are much better than us 
and the US is at an average of 33%, South Africa is 35, Germany is higher, Australia is about 37, but then India is 52% fintech adoption because of the population. Again, the startups, again, you will see that the startup capital of India is 447 people in uh, Bangalore, then followed by Mumbai, and then followed by Delhi. So Bangalore is the startup capital, and uh, this is what the beauty, you know, startups, environment also is very important, and uh, environment of Bangalore is uh, so uh, congenial for uh, startup uh, environment, which is again supporting uh, fintech and uh, disruptive technologies in uh, India. Oh, okay. With, uh, before the billion, next billion opportunity, I want to st stop by and uh, uh, request if you have any questions. Uh, another two, three minutes. I'll take a sip of water. Uh, some uh, it's regarding the data sources regarding the fintech from which sources we can get the data so that we can do the analysis also. Yeah, Gagana, where are you from? I'm from Bangalore, sir. But currently uh, staying in Bangalore, I'm a research scholar from Central University of Tamil Nadu. So basically, uh, data is uh, sellable and uh, it's available at various, like, unbelievable number of uh, suppliers are there. And uh, the bigger problem which we are facing in data is uh, the quality of data. So uh, the data quality is very important. And uh, so once you increase the data quality and uh, guarantees on data quality, uh, one should be able to buy from uh, companies like Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg, then uh, they give data on financials and uh, other things. Then you can get uh, data on stock markets from NSE and BSE. Then you can get data on, uh, you know, uh, the government also has a lot of data and uh, NIC is also having some sources of data. So you have to figure out uh, what segment you're looking at and what is the thing. Banks also have a lot of data. Uh, and uh, FB anyway has uh, humongous data. And uh, you can pick up uh, Google also is a source of data. And Google has an AI platform where you can also pick up data. Uh, so uh, a range of uh, sources are there. But then I think uh, depending on what you need, uh, Gagana, you need to uh, look at that particular uh, segment or that source. Of, uh, yeah, it's regarding the financial technologies, uh, companies existing and what is the net worth of those companies. Regarding those things, I wanted to have the data. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So there's one company called Bank Tech. Okay, company called Bank Tech. And uh, there's another company in Bangalore called Trescon. And these are all exhibitions and uh, they are all uh, companies which you network with financial technology companies and they do exhibitions. So they have resources and uh, names and uh, contacts of uh, financial technology companies. Thank you, sir, for your valuable information. Bank Tech is a very old company, it's about 20 year old company, and uh, it, it has a lot of information. And they have uh, they they have further classification. They have and also there's one company called IDC. Do you know IDC? It's a market research firm. No, sir, I have not. Heard IDC is also it, it comes up with every year uh, report on uh, various technologies and various uh, platforms. Uh, so that is also another area where you can get uh, rich data on uh, statistics as well as uh, the, the thing. And the bank tech also publishes a lot of uh, data. And uh, uh, the financial technology is a predominantly IDC is a authority in that, uh, in bank tech, uh, the financial technology platforms. Any other questions? 
but more than that i would recommend you should become a source of reports <laughs> you get the point i'm i'm trying to do other way around you should pick up raw data and you should process and you should give high quality data to people you have huma humongous human resources in hand okay you should start a big data center and then you should uh, what do you call uh, as a management school uh, you should uh, put up uh, such a uh, what do you call analysis uh, for sale you can sell a lot of uh, such analysis uh, to the market actually in fact i did a fintech program for xime chennai actually and it was a six months program and uh, there are a lot of interesting ideas and uh, the students wanted to do different things and uh, uh, some people wanted to do operations research uh, so operations research is also another set of data which happens so uh, a range of things you can do hr uh, you can do manpower analysis you can do like uh, big data on uh, new joinees you can do you know a range of things on using big data You can also do now COVID impact on uh, placements. See, the COVID impact has changed the workplace, right? A work from home. So you should be a pick up data and then you should come up with a report. I'm just try telling to you management minds to think and uh, come up with some nice things. If anybody wants to do, I'm ready to participate in that and help you guys to build a structure around that. Yeah. And... Uh, so uh, we have a test at the end of this and it's a 20 uh, 17 questions if i'm right and it will uh, i will release the test uh, thing about uh, one o'clock uh, but uh, let me finish off my last portion of the opportunity of the uh, program okay uh, the next billion dollar opportunity a unicorn to be formed in this uh, sector which is called p2p marketplace which is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace like right? uh till now we have been always connecting to the bank okay we're always connecting to the central uh, agency called bank or a nbfc or somebody now in the p2p you can do directly uh, in this room there are about uh, how many people now one sec uh 45 people and uh, assume uh, just imagine everybody decided to put in uh 10 000 rupees uh, so we easily get uh, about 45 lakhs or something like that uh, or 4 lakh 50 thousand rupees on a daily basis so uh, some will be investors some will be wanting loan right so the investors want a return on investment so p2p platform will help you on that so what you can do is that uh, the borrowers or the smes uh, in the p2p platform lender one two three four it's like how crowdsourcing all of us put uh, 10,000 rupees, it goes to the platform and then platform will give you a receipt and it will say your, uh, uh, what you call return on investment is 10%. There are a lot of P2P platforms, go and go Google it. 10% uh, for every three months, P2P platforms are available in India now. So you can put, uh, and you cannot put more than 10,000 rupees or something like that. You can just park 10,000 rupees and then you can get 10%, uh, that is 1,000 rupees every three months. So these small and medium enterprises, this uh, P2P platform may, manages to get uh, give loan and collect loan and then give the returns to lenders. So this is again a P2P platform. It is nothing, no office, nothing. It's online only. So again, it's the same. We calculate the thing, the principal plus interest, the credit and the risk management is managed by the P2P platform. And the loan is given to the borrowers, the lender is given the money and he gets the return on investment of the extra funds he has. So in India, there's a roaring platforms. Not many have come big way. Uh, there's a great opportunity on the P2P lending platform. So again, uh, a big opportunity is that uh, there's a <coughs> currently uh, we're talking about three, three thirty billion dollars. And uh, by FY 2023, it's $730 billion. We are talking about almost like, you know, uh, a $350, uh, $350 billion market size. And uh, you can do a lot of activities. You can do uh, access to internet is there. Then digital influence is there. And digital purchases, are, people are just buying like anything. So you can become 
an online uh, company which does uh, p2p lending and uh, you can do uh, seize the opportunity of almost like 350 billion dollars another trillion dollar opportunity if you expand yourself worldwide this is a worldwide chart and uh, the growth is uh, roaring at about 48 percent year on year and digital lending is a huge uh, proper uh, trillion dollar uh, uh, thing when you go uh, like you can almost like uh, go anywhere in the world and lend on this platform provided you know how to collect the money back so uh, that's a trick and you should uh, that's the solution uh, the solution to which we we'll get the uh, what you call your amazing uh, online business so again global uh, global digital markets i'm just trying to wind up uh, there are some proprietary platforms like amazon uh, uh, marketplace platforms like amazon and then there are uh, common platforms earlier it was ebay and other things even amazon looks like a, uh, a common platform uh, we can say geo is a proprietary platform or something like that uh, but then they are a hybrid they do host somebody else's products and services so they are again a online platform a marketplace which is uh, growing at a breakneck speed of 22% a year ah Thank you very much, Dr. Muthuswamy, Dr. Prasad, Raghu Negi, and uh, Jansi. And uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to quickly uh, share uh, the link uh, and open the uh, test site. And uh, uh, just now I'm going to share the link. Uh, in the yeah. chat box yes sir uh, you can post that uh, uh, you can post that uh, link in chat box also and we will share with participants in mail as well sir uh, now exactly uh, thing is open at uh, 115 it is closed so whoever writes the test they, uh, they pass or they whatever it is the results will be given to the university and uh, whoever didn't do they didn't do that's it so go ahead and uh, i'll keep waiting for your questions uh, fill the form and uh, put your email address and uh, uh, the google form will uh, yeah miss nalu sir two minutes sir actually we need two to three feedback volunteer uh, voluntarily we need two to three feedback so can you extend uh, five minutes uh, five minutes of that uh, uh, time you allocated for closing that uh, window, sir. Valuation window. Okay, one twenty. It is. Yeah, one twenty, sir. Uh, for five uh, five minutes, we have to allocate for this feedback sir, session, sir. Two to three feedback we need. So any questions and answers? Let me know. And take questions and others can fill up the uh, uh, questions. Uh, the, the 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 whatever the questions and then. Uh, I will pass on the thing to the people. So, questions, please. Participants, you can ask your questions to Sir now. And give your feedback on this section. We record two to three feedbacks voluntarily. Participants? So you have a feedback form, Jansi? Yeah. Yes. Do you have a feedback form or something, Barak? No, sir. We we need uh, two to three for, uh, feedbacks voluntarily. Sir, we don't have feedback, sir. Feedback form, sir. We want participants. In lively, we need feedback, sir. Or oh, in the chat box. Are you asking? Not in chat box, no. sir. Not in chat box. We want to make them video conferencing. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. You want them to talk about it? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Participants, please give your feedback. Yeah. Is anybody there? Yeah, there are 49 people. 
I can see. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, very good afternoon, sir. Um, I'm yes, Kanayala Lambaska from uh, Gopal Narayan Singh University, Bihar. Sir, okay. uh, during this session, I have learned a lot of uh, concept related to finance. Basically, I have I have a background of IT. So, but uh, during the sessions, I come to know numbers of technical terms that is related to finance. For this, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for enhancing and enlightening uh, so much information to us. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So tomorrow you will get uh, cryptocurrency things uh, in the morning. Uh, so uh, that will be another uh, you know very interesting thing to understand what is cryptocurrency and the what's the opportunities we have at this moment. Thank you, sir. So I can see no responses now. Yeah, fifteen responses have come. Sir, now it's time to thank, so as to express our gratitude to all those who ensure this program possible. And to do that fitting job, I now request Mr. S. Ganeshan, Research Scholar. Uh, thank you, John. It has been our pleasure to host all the participants of the FDB. The participants were very interested. I am thankful to all the participants for attending the FDB. We have been fortunate to have someone of eminent persons from academia and industry. Our guest for this session, Mr. Pravin sir, was so informative and lively. We are all so, we are all inspired by your great words, sir. Thank you so much for that. I thank our HOD, faculty members, and research scholars of our department, and professors from various departments of our university, and above all participants. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you. So I'm seeing. Uh, uh, I'm seeing average score of fourteen point five. Average score of fourteen point five uh, from the responses, and uh, uh, but. Uh, I have not seen any responses. There are two responses here. I have got two responses. That's it. Kalai Kannan and Professor ASK. That's all. Are there any issues of? Oh, they don't. They, they, Acha, they, they need time. They need time. Okay. Okay. So any uh, question? Sir, actually, first uh, we'll disconnect the meeting. After that, participants can fill the form, sir. So give us uh, fifteen minutes more, sir. I didn't the, get. It. Sir, actually, after disconnecting call, they are going to fill this uh, form. Actually. Oh, okay. Okay. They are doing it on the mobile. Yeah. yeah the, maybe they are attending through mobile, laptop, and also. Oh, After uh, one twenty, sir, you can close your uh, that window, sir. All right. Okay. So okay. thanks a lot, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sure. it is a, Thank you. Uh, a lot of questions and uh, things. Uh, we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Thank you, Praveen sir. Thank you, sir. Participants, you, please rejoin the meeting for our next section by two thirty sharp. And Dear also finish the questions. Also, they should finish the questions. Ah, yes, sir. Bye-bye.